Holston Pills Production. story of Spurs season as seen through the eyes of the White Hart Lane crowd. A season which was to be Glenn Hoddle's last on the patch he made his own. A season in which Clive Allen pushed back the frontiers of goal scoring. A season in which Richard Goff captained Spurs in a triple trophy bid and in which another newcomer, Mitchell Thomas, forced his way into the England squad. It all started for the White Hart Lane faithful against Newcastle United on August Bank Holiday Monday. Two days earlier, Spurs had opened their First Division programme with a convincing 3-0 win at Villa Park, thanks to a hat-trick by Clive Allen. It was a solid start for new manager David Pleat, who'd come from Luton in the summer to replace the departed Peter Shreve. Pleat's priority was to get a settled side, and for the first six matches, including this one against Newcastle, the Spurs lineup was almost exactly the same. Ray Clements in goal, the back four of Gary Stevens, Graham Roberts, Richard Goff and Mitchell Thomas. The last two signed by the new manager from Dundee United and Luton Town respectively. In midfield, there was the versatile Gary Mabbott and the elegant Glenn Hoddle. And the attack had a broad front about it. Chris Waddle on the right, Tony Galvin on the left, Clive Allen and Mark Falco in the middle. At the outset, Paul Allen, Ozzy Ardiles, Danny Thomas and Paul Miller were all battling for their places, while Chris Hewton and John Chidozzi were battling against injuries. As for Newcastle, in the all-grey strip here, They'd lost at home to Liverpool two days earlier, and their main hope of First Division survival appeared to depend on keeping Peter Beardsley, and in this match, keeping out Clive Allen. One thing was certain at this early stage of the season, the new manager certainly wasn't going to abandon Spurs' well-rehearsed passing game. Good combination play there, releasing outside left Tony Galvin. And when the cross comes in, it's Mark Falco who brings a good save out of Thomas. But there wasn't very much punch to the Newcastle attack. And a minute before half-time, to the delight of the 25,000 crowd, Spurs went in front. The goal was made by former Newcastle star Chris Waddle. When goalkeeper Thomas failed to collect his through ball, it rebounded off Clive Allen into the net. His fourth goal in the first two games at the start of what was to become a momentous year for him. In the second half, Spurs again looked to Waddle and Allen to lead the charge. But Newcastle hung on grimly. A second goal in this period would have almost certainly brought Tottenham maximum points from this, their first home fixture. 
but they failed to take their chances. Here, a buccaneering run by Graham Roberts brought a fine piece of anticipation from Thomas and left the Tottenham defender looking to the skies. The hoddle-waddle combination was pleasing to the eye. And with the help of the energetic Clive Allen, they carved out an opening for Mark Falco. But Thomas and Newcastle were still holding firm. And then, just three minutes from the end, Peter Beardsley split the Spurs defence and trundled the ball past Clements for the equaliser. And that's how it ended. Spurs won, Newcastle United won, and two important home points went begging. By the time Everton came to White Hart Lane at the end of September, Spurs were ninth in the table with a record of three wins, two draws and two defeats. The teams who'd beaten them were Southampton and Chelsea. By comparison, Everton were unbeaten and lying third. They showed their pedigree when Adrian Heath put Graham Sharp through against Danny Thomas and Ray Clements had to make a timely save. Mark Falco was on the subs bench and soon on his way to Watford. So Paul Allen picked up the number eight shirt, which he went on to make his own. Everton without their injured goalkeeper Neville Southall and his deputy Bobby Mims was kept busy by a lively Spurs attack in front of a 28,000 crowd. From this corner after 26 minutes, Spurs went in front and it was really a collector's item for the Allen family because number eight Paul was involved three times. His final ball was a treat and so was the neatest of headers from Cousin Clyde, again showing the poacher's instinct inside the six-yard box. 1-0 to Spurs. But early in the second half, Tottenham's passing went through a spell when they couldn't find each other. When Everton threatened to take advantage, Graham Roberts stifled Kevin Sheedy. And soon, Spurs regained the initiative and were testing Mims. Bear in mind it was Everton who'd been a thorn in Peter Shreve's side in his two years as Tottenham manager thwarting Spurs' ambitions in League and Cup. But they were not allowed any leeway on this visit, and the goal that settled the match came almost out of nothing after 68 minutes. Certainly Everton could hardly have seen it coming. A long kick by Ray Clements, and then wait for a sudden stunning shot by Clive Allen. By now, Clive was making the whole country sit up with his goal-scoring prowess. And his two here brought Spurs three points and sent them up to third in the table. Everton failed to score on the day against a tight Spurs defence, in which Goff's influence was already apparent. But for the Merseysiders, this was only a hiccup. They eventually went on to win the championship by nine points from Liverpool and finished 15 points ahead of Spurs in third place. To see where Tottenham went wrong, you only had to look at their next three home matches, which produced only two points out of a possible nine. They drew against Luton, drew with Sheffield Wednesday, and lost at White Hart Lane in a stormy match against Wimbledon. October saw the start of Spurs Littlewoods Cup campaign at White Hart Lane. In a two-leg tie against second division Barnsley, 
Tottenham had won 3-2 at Oakwell in the first match, thanks to goals from Clive Allen, Chris Waddle and Graham Roberts. Although for this second leg, Allen was rested and took his place on the subs bench along with cousin Paul. It meant a first chance in the senior side for Spurs striker Sean Close, a local lad just 20 years old who'd come through the youth training scheme. Barnsley goalkeeper Clive Baker was in for a busy evening. But so too, in an unexpected way, at the other end was Ray Clements. A moderate crowd of 12,000 saw plenty of thrills. But one of the biggest was for Sean Close. Because from Glen Hoddle's corner, he snapped up the ball at the far post to score his first senior goal and increase Spurs' aggregate lead to himself started and finished the next goal. He found Danny Thomas, who in turn put Chris Waddle away. Glenn had stationed himself beyond the far post, and when the cross came in, he squeezed the ball into the net for his first of the season. But Barnsley also scored in the first half, so a 2-1 lead for Spurs on the night meant they led 5-3 on aggregate. Paul Miller was making a now rare first-team appearance. From his free kick, Ardiles found Waddle, and Close was just that with a header. <laughs> Alan Clark's plucky Barnsley were not prepared to lie down, and their experienced defender, Paul Butcher, held them together, conceding a corner there to stop Tony Galvin. Just watch this Tottenham gem. Ardiles to Waddle, then Hoddle, and a glorious goal. A Glen Hoddle special. 3-1 now to Spurs on the night, and 6-3 on aggregate. Graham Roberts now tried to get into the scoring action himself. Although it wouldn't be too long before the wholehearted defender was on the move to Glasgow Rangers, where he later won a championship medal. Chris Waddle goes across to take the corner and watch for an instant header here by Tony Galvin. Baker can't keep it out and that makes it 4-1 to Spurs. But although they now held a four-goal aggregate lead, Barnsley was still determined to preserve their dignity and that goal by centre-back Larry May put them back in business. Spurs had brought on both Allens as substitutes, and there were further chances at both ends. from a Chris Waddle cross, Clive Allen bundled in number five. 
Now it was 8-4 overall, and Spurs were safely through. But a mistake by Danny Thomas allowed Barnsley a late consolation goal. In the third round, Spurs opponents again came from the second division. The match against Birmingham City gave Tottenham supporters one of their early glimpses in a Spurs shirt of Nico Klassen, the little Belgian international signed by David Cleet for £600,000 on the strength of his World Cup displays in Mexico, where Belgium reached the semi-final. Nico's Tottenham career had got off to a great start when they beat Liverpool 1-0 at Anfield on his debut. But Spurs' league form was still inconsistent, as Pleat wondered how to incorporate Klassen in a team which often played with only one striker. However, these problems were not evident against a poor Birmingham side, who crumbled before a crowd of 15,000. Chris Waddle, number nine there, was the man who scored the first goal. Tottenham's new manager was certainly keen on the stylish football the club's tradition demands. Here's a move that was vintage Tottenham, involving the newcomer Klassen. Now Graham Roberts, then across to Mitchell Thomas, and back to Roberts again. Spurs' second goal was an absolute beauty. It started there back in their own penalty area, with Paul Allen doing the donkey work. But watch for a precise piercing pass here from Glenn Hoddle, and a devastating finish to follow from Clive Allen. One of Tottenham's best goals of the season. The half-time score was 2-0, but now in the second half, Spurs added three more goals. They were gaining a lot now from their well-rehearsed corners and free kicks. And certainly Birmingham didn't know how to cope with them. This left-wing corner is taken by Paul Allen, but watch for cousin Clive, who scores with a header. 3-0 to Tottenham. Every Spurs player was looking to get in now on the act of goal scoring. Gary Mabbott, adaptable in defence or attack, brought a great reaction save out of goalkeeper Roger Hansbury. But it only delayed the inevitable. It's another corner on the Tottenham left. And again, it's Paul Allen who takes it. This time, watch for Graham Roberts, number four, whose fierce volley has too much power for the Birmingham keeper. That made it 4-0. Spurs were now rampant, and Hoddle had the last word with that classic free kick. Spurs won at Cambridge in the next round to reach the quarter-finals. By the time Nottingham Forest came to White Hart Lane in the league at the end of November, they were second in the championship race after making a splendid start. And their team included young centre-back Chris Fairclough, who Spurs fans would get to know well later on. The same could be said of the Forest captain, Dutch international Johnny Metgod, who would also join Spurs the following summer. As for Tottenham themselves, 10th in the table at this point, they got off to a very bad start before a crowd of 30,000. After two minutes, young John Polston, playing at number five in place of Goff, was robbed by Nigel Clough. And Ray Clements brought the Forest centre forward down. In spite of Ray's protests, referee Gifford had no option but to award Forest a penalty kick. 
It was the best possible start for Brian Clough's team, who'd come to London a few weeks earlier and scored six goals against Chelsea. Their penalty expert, left-back Stuart Pearce, was Mitchell Thomas's main rival as deputy for Kenny Sansom in the England squad. And he certainly showed his confidence in the way he put Forrest ahead. With Paul Allen wearing the number two shirt in this match, Spurs went about trying to put things right. Des Walker forced to clear hurriedly there to Forrest. From Glen Hoddle's corner, Mabbott found Clive Allen, but for once, he was just off target. Then, in another Tottenham assault, Clive was twice unlucky. And Segers doing a fine job in the Forest goal. But after 36 minutes, it proved third time lucky for Clive. Oh, yeah. He turned in his 20th goal of the season, and we weren't even as far as December. Now with the score 1-1, Hoddle almost got Waddle into the act. In the second half, Spurs maintained their momentum. Ozzy Ardiles fouled by Stuart Pearce. A free kick to Spurs, and again, they made the set-piece tell. Chris Waddle took the kick, Clive Allen scored. 58 minutes gone, Spurs 2, Nottingham Forest 1. Now a free kick to Forest inside the Spurs penalty area. Stuart Pearce's shot pushed out by Clements, and the man who scored from out of your picture was Chris Fairclough making it 2-2. Now it was anybody's game. A waddle cross puzzled Seggers. But Glenn Hoddle, coming in behind the keeper, couldn't force the ball inside the post. Johnny Met got on the ball for Forrest and number 11, Gary Mills, was starting to cause concern on the left flank of the Spurs' defence. How about this for a slick move from Forrest? The final shot from Metgod, superbly saved by Ray Clements. Now Gary Fleming joins the Forest attack to link with Mills. Gary Birtles plays a part, but the executioner here, number six, Neil Webb, whose shot gives Forest a 3-2 win. An exciting 3-3 draw at Old Trafford was then followed by a home match against Watford, one place below Spurs in mid-table, and Spurs got off to a flyer. An error by David Bardsley let in Chris Waddle. Roberts and Galvin both got touches, but it was Glenn Hoddle who fired in his first league goal of the season after ten minutes. Soon afterwards, the influential Hoddle created a chance for Graham Roberts at the far post. It
it was all Spurs. Two minutes before half-time, Hoddle was again the provider. Richard Goff drilled in a header for his first goal for Tottenham. Watford keeper Tony Coton was given no chance with the power of that. In the second half, the enterprising Goff could have scored again. But instead, it was an old Tottenham favourite who got one back at the other end. 70 minutes gone now, and Mark Falco scores for Watford. The final score, Spurs 2, Watford 1. On Boxing Day, Steve Hodge, Spurs £750,000 signing from Aston Villa, made his debut against West Ham in bright sunshine at White Hart Lane, before a crowd of nearly 40,000. It was to be an exciting match. After 13 minutes, Clive Allen, with a typically snatched effort from a corner, put Spurs in front. His cousin Paul was keen to do well against his old club, especially as the Hammers started this match just two places below Spurs in the table, seventh to Tottenham's fifth. As always, West Ham added to the entertainment. Ray Clements was a busy man, and that continued in the second half. Here, he had to make a double save, first from Alan Devonshire, and then from Tony Cotty. After 53 minutes, a flowing Tottenham move. Waddle and Hoddle combining on the right. Paul Allen working hard on the left. And Steve Hodge marking his debut by scoring to make it 2-0 to Spurs. No wonder he looked so delighted, and so too were the fans on the shelf. Some of Spurs' second-half football here compared with anything they produced all season. This riveting move ended with Chris Waddle slotting in number three. A brilliant goal. Spurs now were in full cry. And at the end of this attack, can you work out quite how West Ham goalkeeper Phil Parks manages to keep out another effort from newcomer Steve Hodge? The lively Hodge was also involved in Spurs' fourth goal after 68 minutes. Again, he was foiled by Parks, but this time Clive Allen was on hand to score his 26th goal of the season and make the final score Spurs 4, West Ham 0. An historic moment at White Hart Lane early in 1987 as the two North London rivals met for the 100th time in league football. But the more topical statistic was Arsenal's run of 18 games without defeat, a club record in George Graham's first season as manager at Highbury. They'd not lost since the end of September and had a clear lead at the top of the first division. Spurs were fifth after winning at Charlton on New Year's Day. Despite live television, a crowd of nearly 38,000 were there to welcome the two teams. But it was Arsenal who kept their cool in pouring rain. At the end where their fans were congregated, they took an early lead. 
Viv Anderson's shot there was scrambled away from off the line. But as Spurs tried to move out, Kenny Sansom whipped the ball back in. The touch there by Niall Quinn, and the goal goes to Tony Adams. It was a terrific start for Arsenal, and it took Spurs a while to recover. They could have gone two down. Quinn again, and Rowcastle hits the post. Tottenham at this stage were looking for a foothold in the match, as well as on the greasy pitch. The shot there from Danny Thomas. Now, 39 minutes gone, a free kick to Arsenal. Number eight, Paul Davis, is the man who shoots, and the ball takes a deflection off the Tottenham wall to make it 2-0 to the Gunners. It might even have been three. Steve Williams broke away from midfield, but this time, Clements made the save. Four minutes before half-time, Spurs found a way back into the picture. Mitchell Thomas, number three, joined the attack. David O'Leary cleared for Arsenal, but Spurs one possession back. Clive Allen plays an important part here in the actual build-up. Wide to Glenn Hoddle, and as the cross comes in, Thomas has stayed forward to put Spurs back in the game at 2-1. That's how it was at half-time. In the second half, Tottenham had by far the greater share of play. And Lukic survived, sometimes only just. Arsenal was starting to look rattled. But again, luck is on the goalkeeper's side. Chris Waddle trying to find a way through for Spurs with the help of Tony Galvin. Substitute Nico Klassen is foiled here by Tony Adams, and Arsenal hung on to win. Fans didn't know it, but this was to be the first of three Arsenal victories at White Hart Lane in just a matter of two months. Meanwhile, six days later, Spurs opened their FA Cup programme with a third round tie against 4th Division Scunthorpe United at White Hart Lane. Scunthorpe's goalkeeper, Ron Green, made an early save from Steve Hodge. But the crowd of 19,300 didn't have long to wait for the opening goal. Danny Thomas and Steve Hodge involved in the move. And when Chris Waddle got in his cross, it was Gary Mabbott sliding in to put Spurs in front. A well-taken goal. But Scunthorpe were no pushover. This, after all, was their cup final. And when they beat the Spurs off side trap, top scorer Steve Johnson arrived at the far post to equalise. So, no easy cup tie for Spurs against 4th Division opposition. Now in the second half, the score is still 1-1. And it was a good thing for Tottenham that, from Glenn Hoddle's corner, Nico Klassen showed his alert scoring touch. That second goal really broke the back of Gallant Scunthorpe. But Spurs' third was one well worth waiting for. And one of the best individual goals seen at White Hart Lane throughout the whole season. It came from number nine, Chris Waddle. What a fabulous instant strike.
But even now, Scunthorpe fought doggedly. Spurs got rather slack. And number four, Ken Demange, on loan from Liverpool, scored a superb individual goal. Final score, Spurs three, Scunthorpe two. That gave Spurs a fourth round tie at home to Crystal Palace, for whom Andy Gray missed a very good opening early on. Palace would live to regret that miss. They say you need lots of luck to do well in the FA Cup, and certainly Spurs couldn't complain about the draw this season. Having edged past 4th Division Scunthorpe in the third round, they now found themselves at home again to opposition from a lower division. Mind you, early on, Steve Coppel's Crystal Palace made Tottenham work hard. And they might have pulled off a shock result if Gray had done better with that early chance. The crowd of 30,000 for this London derby saw Gary Mabbott put Spurs in front, and later in the first half, former Tottenham defender Gary O'Reilly, now at the heart of the Palace back four, put through his own goal to give Spurs a two-goal advantage. At this stage in the season, Spurs were lying fifth in the first division and making progress in both cup competitions. So David Fleet's plans looked as though they were taking shape. With Nico Klassen back on the substitute's bench, Spurs were again using their five-man midfield formation, with just Clive Allen up front. In the second half, Glenn Hoddle tested Palace's experienced goalkeeper George Wood with a free kick. It was all Spurs, and Gray's frustration spilled over when he fouled Hodge and was booked by the referee. Still 2-0 to Tottenham, but Palace weren't posing much of a threat at the other end. On the break, substitute Klassen broke through and shot over the bar. It was a crisp, competitive cup tie between two London teams. But just when Palace might have thought they could draw breath and stage a recovery, Chris Waddle came back to win the board in his own half and embarked on a thrilling run. It ended when he was tripped by number seven, Tony Finnegan, inside the penalty area. The linesman signalled to the referee that it was a penalty kick and that prompted a storm of protest from Palace. It was some time before the kick could be taken. But it was an important one for Clive Allen, given the chance here to score his 30th goal of the season. Goalkeeper Wood's delaying tactics almost worked. He came very close to saving that shot, but it was 3-0 to Spurs. Palace did have their moments. One of their openings fell to number 11, Phil Barber. But quick 
thinking by Ray Clements saved the situation. And Gray shot over the bar. Spurs were clearly safely through to the fifth round. But there was still time for one more goal. And time too for a good interchange between Glenn Hoddle and Chris Waddle. The scorer, Nico Klassen. Four nil to Tottenham. And the first goal to Spurs, goal by number fourteen. Just two days later, a crowd of nearly forty-two thousand were at White Hart Lane for the replay of the Littlewoods Cup quarter-final between Spurs and West Ham. And that reflex save early on by Clements from Billy Bonds indicated what an exciting evening this was going to be. In the first match at Upton Park, a goal by Clive Allen had been answered by an equaliser from Tony Cotty. And West Ham seemed determined to start here where they left off. Alvin Martin, in a good position, put his header over the bar. Gary Mabbott warding off Frank McAvenny. And it was really Spurs' overseas connection that was to prove influential here. Nico Klassen was back in the starting lineup, foraging for opportunities up front. And the man who found him in a telling position was Ozzy Ardiles with an exquisite through pass. Klassen able to show the Spurs fans high quality finishing. 1 0 to Tottenham. But despite those celebrations, West Ham were not prepared to succumb just yet. Tony Cotty was still a threat, and it would be easy to overlook Clement's contribution to this Tottenham performance. It was Spurs' pace which gradually wore down West Ham, but in a match of great quality and rapid movement, there were thrills in both penalty areas as the two teams adopted an attacking approach. Just enjoy a few of the best moments again now.
goal by Glenn Hoddle. And my word, how it relieved the tension for Tottenham. That shot received a rapturous reception from the Spurs crowd. And Glenn's colleagues celebrated a 2-0 lead. But the Hammers still weren't finished. Just look at how they retaliated. Then West Ham's resistance was finally broken. Nico Klassen made the third goal for Clive Allen, who forced the ball in off the unlucky Phil Parks. That made it 3-0, and Spurs were now chasing the four by which they'd beaten West Ham in that earlier league meeting. Paul Allen, once again lifting his game against his old colleagues, ran them ragged at times in midfield. Parks saved there from Klassen. Paul Allen again. And in a fatigued West Ham defence, Alvin Martin makes a tired tackle. It's a penalty to Spurs. Paul Allen doing the hard work and Clive Allen taking the responsibility once again from the penalty spot. The chance to make it 4-0. Soon Spurs go one better. Ardiles and Hoddle set up the play and the Allen family are in harmony once more. Paul's surging run, a fingertip save by Parks, and Clive swoops for goal number five, and his hat-trick in the space of just eight minutes. Spurs are through to the semi-final. The Allens are in ecstasy. But Wembley beckons on two fronts, because later in February, Newcastle are back at White Hart Lane in the fifth round of the FA Cup. By now, Spurs have dropped to sixth in the league, so it's cup fever that grips the 38,000 fans inside the ground. And maybe it affected Spurs left-back Mitchell Thomas as he let in Paul Goddard. But from this free kick came the incident that settled the tie. Did Peter Jackson push Richard Goff? The referee said yes, and Newcastle was certainly not united with him. The Geordie's complaints were long and furious, but they were to no avail. Eventually, Clive Allen belted in another penalty. Bringing his total for the season to 35 goals. Rather like that West Ham match, this was a compelling cup tie with some stirring football. The game moving swiftly from end to end. Newcastle brought nearly 10,000 supporters from the North East and they added a passionate edge to the excitement. The 
the incidents came thick and fast. And now we'll let you sit back again and simply enjoy the football. So, as an absorbing cup tie came to its conclusion, most people agreed Spurs were good value for their 1-0 win. In the sixth round, Spurs were drawn away to win. The next visitors to Tottenham were Leicester City in a rearranged league match. Leicester was struggling near the bottom of the first division. But for 35 minutes, they held Spurs at bay. Quite how, 
nobody was quite sure. Maybe the pictures coming up will tell their own story. Chris Waddle and it's Nico Klassen who puts Tottenham ahead. A splendid shot. One nil to Spurs. Gary Stevens was wearing the number 10 shirt in the absence of Glenn Hoddle. goal was having a very busy night. Good play again by Steve Hodge. Stevens touches the ball on to Waddle. Hodge's cross. A volley by Mabbott. Appeals for handball waved away. The Spurs attack is relentless. Paul Allen to Klassen. And Paul Allen again. A diving header by Hodge. Eventually, Leicester had to crack. Hodge now in the second half. That was Stevens. Thomas. In goes Paul Allen, and goalkeeper Andrews brings him down. Yet another penalty to Tottenham. spot as usual increasing Spurs lead to 2-0 and there was plenty more to come this time Paul Allen scores involved in the build-up again. So to his cousin. And inevitably, the man on the end of it, Clive Allen. That made it 
Chris Waddle away on the left for Tottenham. And a fine save by the goalkeeper who had to change direction to meet the deflection. Leicester attack. But at this stage in the game, they were hardly going to disturb Tottenham's superiority. Spurs simply went out and got number five. By now, the match had turned into a superb personal performance for Paul Allen. In the course of 13 minutes, he had a hand in four goals. He put Nico Klassen away there, and the shot dropped between the goalkeeper and the near post. Spurs 5, Leicester City 0. Could Spurs go one better? beat their total against West Ham? Certainly, Paul Allen was still very much involved. And so was Klassen. All in all, an easy win for Spurs. in this move, but Andrews denied Chris Waddle the luxury of goal number six. Leicester were torn apart, notably by Waddle. Back now to the Littlewoods Cup. Spurs had beaten Arsenal 1-0 at Highbury in the first leg of the semi-final. And 37,000 were here at White Hart Lane for the return. Arsenal, encouraged by their success here in the league two months earlier, went close early on. But after 16 minutes, a mistake by their goalkeeper John Lukic allowed Spurs to increase their aggregate lead. He fumbled Richard Goff's free kick and allowed Clive Allen to swoop for his 38th goal of the season. Surely now, Spurs were on their way to Wembley. They should have been. One attack piled on another in that first half but David Pleat's team seemed destined never to quite break the back of Arsenal's resistance, even though it was precarious at times. The Gunners were under heavy artillery. But their defence wobbled without collapsing. When, just before half-time, David Rowcastle went close, the warning lights began flashing for Spurs. Even so, early in the second half, before a live television audience, Tottenham should really have sewn up the tie.
It seems churlish to blame Clive Allen, of all people, for missing a good chance. But it did prove costly. Almost at once, at the other end, following an Arsenal throw-in near the corner flag, Viv Anderson squeezed the equaliser in at the near post. 1-1 on the day, but Arsenal is still one behind on aggregate. Not for long. Niall Quinn starts the move by playing the ball to Paul Davis. Out it goes to Rowcastle, and look who's on the far post. Quinn again to turn the ball in and level the aggregate at two goals each. Now it's extra time. Even then, Spurs might have won it. Substitute Tony Galvin's lob beats the keeper, but's headed out from underneath the crossbar by David O'Leary. Spurs won the toss to stage the decisive third match at White Hart Lane just three days later. This time Arsenal, themselves tilting at three trophies, made the better start. And that man Quinn caused Spurs' hearts to miss a beat again. It soon developed into another epic cup tie. And Nico Klassen was mighty close for Spurs. The game ebbed and flowed between the two North London rivals. Tottenham generally were having the better of things. And at the end of this move, Chris Waddle missed a chance which on reflection should have gone in. After 62 minutes, Clive Allen completed a quite remarkable hat-trick. For the third time in these semi-final matches, he put Spurs ahead in the game. It followed a free kick on the Tottenham right, lofted in by Ozzy Ardiles. Richard Goff won the ball in the air, and Allen pounced to set a record of 12 goals in the Littlewoods Cup in one season. Spurs were still leading from that goal until seven minutes from the end. Then the match took a completely unexpected late turn. Arsenal had made a substitution, taking off Charlie Nicholas and replacing him with Ian Allenson. And it was his work on the left-hand side that undid all that Tottenham had achieved earlier. First of all, Allenson surprised Clements at the near post. And for Tottenham, worse was to follow. David O'Leary's free kick broke first to Allenson and then to Rowcastle. And Arsenal were on their way to Wembley. In the league, Liverpool came to White Hart Lane at the end of March, having won 10 and drawn two of their last 12 matches to take a commanding lead in the championship. They were nearly in the lead there through Paul Walsh. Spurs were fourth at this stage and had to win here to keep up their title hopes. Again before a live television audience, it was the artistry of Chris Waddle on Tottenham's right that was to prove decisive. One of his typical tantalising runs ended with him beating Bruce Grobelaar with a bouncing shot. A year earlier, also on live television, Waddle had put Spurs ahead in this fixture 
only to find Liverpool staging a second half recovery which won them the game in the very last minute. This year it was going to be different because Spurs had the better of things after the break. In a number of well-directed attacks, Tottenham might have increased their lead. persevering with his five-man midfield and it worked against the Liverpool side whose last defeat in the league had been three months earlier on Boxing Day. Indeed, Spurs' victory here was a turning point in the championship in 1986-87 because Liverpool lost their next two matches against Wimbledon and Norwich and they were eventually overtaken by neighbours Everton who went on to win the title. Spurs' best chance seemed to be third place and they moved there permanently when Paul Miller and his new club Charlton came to White Hart Lane in April. Nico Carson made an early chance for Steve Hodge. Glenn Hoddle's Tottenham career was drawing towards a close and he seemed determined to go out on a high note. Just a week earlier, Spurs had beaten Watford 4-1 at Villa Park in the FA Cup semi-final. So, with a place at Wembley now assured, the 28,000 crowd were in high spirits in a match which produced only one goal. Bob Boulder made a fine save from Paul Allen to delay the inevitable. But it finally came a minute before half-time. And the build-up to the goal showed again what progress Steve Hodge had made down Tottenham's left flank. A nice little cross, and Clive Allen scores easily. His 46th goal of the season. And now, Clive had overtaken the original Tottenham scoring record of Jimmy Greaves. In the second half, Spurs should really have had more goals. They certainly had all the play. And Paul Miller and the Charlton defenders were stretched time and time again. They had goalkeeper Boulder to thank for some fine saves. That one from Nico Klassen. Paul Allen again working overtime in midfield. And at the end of the next Tottenham attack, it was Steve Hodge who tested the goalkeeper. And finally, Paul Allen put the ball over the bar. Charlton weren't having much luck either in their few and far between attacks. This was Ralph Milne with a shot, beautifully saved by Ray Clemens. So... Another team fighting relegation were Oxford United, who had sold their top scorer John Aldridge to Liverpool and were trying to avoid being involved in the playoffs between clubs from the bottom of the first division and the top of the second. Not that that concerned Tottenham. Spurs had won 4-2 at the Manor Ground earlier in the season and were looking here to move up to full throttle in time for the FA Cup final at Wembley when their opponents would be Coventry City.
the match got off to a fairly slow start. But when Spurs warmed up, they played some nice football. It took Tottenham 10 minutes to take the lead. And when the goal came, the man who found a way through was Steve Hodge, now showing his England quality on Spurs' left flank. His cross and a crisp header into the corner by Chris Waddle. Two of David Peake's 5 man midfield combining sweeping. Five minutes later, more close understanding between the Allens. Clive paves the way, and Paul picks up a most deserved reward. 2-0 to Spurs, and Oxford's defence in trouble. But from this Oxford corner, a rare mistake by Ray Clements allowed Dean Saunders to force the ball home of Chris Hewton. 26 minutes gone, Spurs 2, Oxford 1. Glenn Hoddle was looking to go out in style. He clipped the bar in the first half, and in this, his penultimate home performance, he was keen to get among the scorers. Mind you, so too was Clive Allen. Now in the second half, his total for the season was 47, and he was striving to reach the half century before he ran out of games. As the second half wore on, it was clear that several Spurs players were trying to enhance their claim for cup final places. One of them was right back Chris Hewton, who would soon come under challenge for the number two shirt from the fit again Gary Stevens. Crosses like that were doing Hewton's case no harm at all. Chris Waddle, who won over so many Spurs fans during the season, continued to delight them. And after he had hit the bar, goalkeeper Peter Hutton saved well from Steve Hodge. Then in the last minute, as an Oxford attack broke down, it happened. Glenn Hoddle's last goal for Tottenham, and what a treat it was. A lavish, lasting memory for Spurs fans as Glenn set off for a new life in Monaco. On the morning of the Maybank holiday, Manchester United were the visitors to White Hart Lane. Under new manager Alex Ferguson, United were really building for next season. They lay a modest 11th in the first division, as against Spurs' third place. But the great crowd pillars still drew 37,000 people, who saw Paul Allen go close there after bursting through midfield. At the other end, John Sieverbeck's cross found Norman Whiteside, but Ray Clements was as alert as ever. A few minutes later, the experienced goalkeeper's reflexes were tested again by the same player. But the Spurs defender who had more reason to remember this match even than Clements was left back Mitchell Thomas. He had shown several times during the season already a happy knack of arriving in the opposing penalty area at the right time. So, when Chris Waddle crossed from the right, it was no surprise to find Mitchell on the spot to put Spurs ahead after half an hour. United 
vainly appealing for offside. In the second half, it was nearly all Tottenham as United defended frantically. Ball passed by Paul McGrath, intercepted by Chris Waddle. And a push by John Cedarbeck on Steve Hodge means a penalty to Spurs. Afterwards, Alex Ferguson blamed his side for what he called a pathetic display. But there were no such worries for David Pleat, nor indeed for Clive Allen given the opportunity here from yet another penalty to take his total for the season to 48. Spurs now were in full cry and United were pulled first one way and then the other. Thomas, at the top of your picture, took the opportunity to move forward to join the attack, which was brought up on the other side by Chris Waddle. Paul Allen's cross, this time Thomas hits the post. Little was seen of the Manchester United attack, and Brian Robson's midfield was overrun. Gary Walsh in goal was working overtime. Spurs continued to move sweetly, but when the third goal came after 63 minutes, it was certainly one of the cheekiest seen at White Hart Lane during the season. Watch for Mitchell Thomas and the overhead kick. Three nil to Spurs. Not surprisingly, Mitchell is now a leading contender for man of the match. And he helped create the fourth goal after 74 minutes. Clive Allen went goal hunting again, but it was Cousin Paul who applied the finishing touch to inflict on United their heaviest defeat of the season. Spurs 4, Manchester United 0. And it seemed then as though Tottenham were in good heart for the FA Cup final against Coventry. So what conclusions can we draw from these home highlights of 1986-87? Many Spurs followers called it a nearly year. Tottenham were third in the table behind Everton and Liverpool. No disgrace in that, especially when you bear in mind Arsenal finished fourth. But the North London Honours went Arsenal's way in the semi-final of the Littlewoods Cup. And perhaps the biggest disappointment of all for Spurs was losing in the FA Cup final to Coventry City. For most other clubs, it would have been a prodigious season. But for Spurs, who ended 1987 under the exciting new management of Terry Venables, it wasn't quite good enough. One thing it never lacked, though, was excitement, style and news value. And those things will never be missing at White Hart Lane.